Living Adventurously is brought to you in partnership with Kamut, the route planning and navigation app that helps you make the most of your outdoor adventures. Whether you're cycling, hiking, running or bikepacking, Kamut's easy to use technology will get you out the door and exploring more of the great outdoors. You can see where I've been exploring by checking out the highlights of my journey on Kamut. Just follow the link in the show notes. My name is Alistair Humphreys. I set out on a bicycle journey around Yorkshire to speak to interesting, ordinary people who, in very different ways, are making an effort to live adventurously. I wanted to talk about what they do, about the barriers they've faced along the way, and to seek their perspective on some of the big questions that all of us encounter in our lives. Welcome to Living Adventurously. <laughs> I've written here, needs intro music. Um, okay, here we go. Um... <laughs> Have a loop. Professor Ian Rotherham is a man positively bursting with enthusiasm and knowledge and ideas. In the couple of hours I was with him before I pressed record, Ian poured forth a cheerful stream of lessons for me on the environment, um, ecotourism, Sheffield United, rewilding and ancient woodland heritage. He's written masses of books. Um, we talked when I did press record, we talked about Sheffield's notorious council campaign of chopping down thousands of the city trees, um, the cultural severance that's taken place between cities and wildness, and also the reassuring dictum that you can change the world a little bit at a time, perhaps beginning with rewilding your own back garden. Just so I can get the sound levels... Um... What are you going to have for tea tonight? I'm going to have whatever I get around to cooking when I get home. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> are you a good cook? Probably I am, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> so my wife tells me. Okay. <laughs> What's your speciality? Um, oh, I do a very good uh, oven-baked salmon. Oh. But I do, I mean, I often do vegetarian food as well. I was going to well, say, so you I, I do, no, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought you would be. <laughs> Um, right, that's sounding pretty good. Um, well, you see, if you're vegetarian, you lose all your hay meadows. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which in some parts of the country, are really, like the Dales, really important. Yeah. So if you have no, I mean, particularly if you're a vegan non-dairy, you lose all the pastures and all the meadows. Yeah, yeah. Tricky one. It, oh, gosh. One, so I, <laughs> I've, recently, I've become a vegetarian. And I'm nearly a vegan. Right. But the one thing I'm learning from this is that it's really not simple. Mm. So, right. I'm a vegetarian, so I'll eat lots of avocados. Mm. They'll be good. And then you learn how terrible they are. Yeah, yeah. I love avocados. So do I. Yeah. But I'm now <laughs> realising that pretty much everything I eat is disastrous. <laughs> um, so could you just hold it up? Near yeah, me? yeah. Yeah, that's good. Is um, that okay? Yeah, and the, cons the, con the consistency is the main thing, really. Yeah. Okay. Um Joining me today is, by a considerable way, the most qualified person I've spoken to so far, uh, Professor Ian Rotherham, uh, BSc Ons, PhD, PGC, oh MSB, <laughs> CBID, M-I-E-E-M, C-E-N-V. Yeah. Thank you for deigning to talk to an <laughs> idiot like me. Uh, this is a question I always ask of people with PhDs, um, and it has zero follow-ups deliberately, but what was the title of your PhD? It was the ecology of rhododendron ponticum. What's oh, no follow-up questions? What's ponticum? It means it's the rhododendron, and it actually means the red tree from Turkey. It's the pontus, and most people think rhododendrons come from the Himalayas. And I've even had quite expert ecologists present at conferences saying that they were from the Himalayas, which they weren't. Well, I'm slightly disappointed by your PhD title because <laughs> it's actually quite understandable. Yeah. Often they're... <laughs> often, the reason I always ask people about them is because they're often so spectacularly niche. 
um, which I suppose is part of the. It point, had a subtitle, it? which is probably not oh, so comprehensible. Then. Give me that. <laughs> it was with special reference to the mycorrhizal infections. Good. Yeah. Now we're getting out. That's of my better. Yeah, that's, that's better. Yeah. So to get back back into my uh, kind of comfort zone, what is your favourite tree? What as a species or an individual? Ah, good. Good point. Both. Yeah. I think my favourite tree of all is probably the major oak. And I recently wrote a book about the veteran trees of Sherwood Forest, trying to understand what happened to them. Um, We start off with about 40,000 fantastic oak trees in 1600, and we're now down to about about 1,000, and quite a few of those are dead. Um, So I think probably the major oak is my favourite actual species, actual individual tree, and my favourite species is probably the small-leaved lime. Nice. For the the buzzing of the bees and the... Not Well, yeah, partly, but also my mentor at university was a very eminent botanist called uh, Professor Donald Piggott, and he is the world's leading authority. Donald is about 90 now, and he's still the world's leading authority on lime trees and basswoods. Okay. And he introduced me to this species when I was a, a fledgling student. Uh, and some of the, the, the lime trees grow and they grow up, and then they fall over every three or four hundred years. But the stems are connected as what we call a clone. And some of these individual trees in remote parts of uh, Coniston, for example, above Coniston Water, are estimated to be over 2,000 years old. Wow. So I think that's a species that is tenacious and yeah. it deserves all the respect <laughs> that you can possibly <laughs> find for it. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um so I've I've only known you for about an hour, but um, the the reason I got in touch with you at first was I was looking for curious, passionate people with purpose. That's the thing that really excites me about different people. And we've been chatting for about an hour, and you've basically just poured an hour's worth of. I, mean, I could spend months thinking about all the things you've taught me. So I'm not surprised that um, you had an eloquent answer to your tree. What's your favourite bird? Oh, my favourite individual bird at this moment is um, almost it's a pet, a moorhen that's taken up residence in my garden, which I'm particularly fond of because you don't often get moorhens in ordinary bike gardens in suburban Sheffield. Uh, and this visited in the winter and it's been here uh, ever since. They said it left to go and breed on a nearby park pond and then this week it came back, much to my amazement. <laughs> so I think my pet moorhen. Nice. My um, undergraduate dissertation was on um, coots. All right, yeah, um, yeah. And I've disliked them ever since. Yeah, <laughs> <Too> <laughs> it much. can have that effect, yes. can't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, some of you, you're a, the prof- a professor of environmental geography and reader in tourism and environmental change. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I was interested in the... the looking at ecotourism, sustainable tourism, and how that transfers to my world of adventure and what direction the adventure community should move in. Um, One of the reasons I'm spending a whole month cycling around Europe is to try to seek out adventure without flying. So can I have adventure? Can I have new, interesting experiences without flying? So what what are some of the misconceptions of the ecotourism movement um, and what what direction should adventure be moving in do you think yeah i mean ecotourism i think is an issue because it's a bit like rewilding as a phrase it's something that's been popularly adopted but it actually doesn't mean really what people think it means so pure ecotourism has got the idea of take only photographs leave only footprints now that means you're having no economic social or other effects Positive or negative. So should it be take only photographs, leave only footprints and a load of cash? A load of cash or a cheque or whatever. Okay, would, yeah. that, would, that, yeah, be a, yeah. would that be a... Yeah, basically any tourism is going to change people. And we have to find ways to change people in a supportive and benign way. And one of the sad things that we're losing throughout the world at the moment are the last vestiges of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous cultures. Um, And there is a big, big issue, which I know quite a few people 
in the adventure world, explorers and the like have highlighted um, that once some of these peoples have contact with Western culture, then they know that their culture will ultimately decline. And it's a horrible, horrible fact of our existence. So we need to find ways of doing it better. We need to find ways of giving people a, a proper choice of what they want. Um, with ecotourism, there's an issue that it doesn't really mean what it says on the can. I do a lot of work on wildlife tourism, on heritage tourism, um, religious tourism, spirituality, things like that. And you're looking at finding ways that you can harness the power of tourism to support local communities and to support the local environment, support local nature. That is having an impact, so it's not actually pure ecotourism. But do, can, can it be um, a positive force, so whether for the environment or for the cultures, or if we truly care about the world's wild places, should we not go to them and just stay at home? I think it's, it's a terribly fine balance. I mean, it's the, the Attenborough question, because David Attenborough has been accused of giving a sort of uh, rose-tinted view of the natural world without dealing with the, the nasty bits. And to some extent, you've got to do both, and you can't just have uh, a negative message. So I think exposing people to the wonders of nature, to harnessing that, I think is hugely, hugely important. With adventure, um, I think, again, there, there are issues. We did a review a little while back, a postgraduate and myself, of literature on mountain biking. And a lot of it is actually phrased in ways which are, from a conservation point of view, quite worrying. It's about defeating nature rather than being in nature. Conquering Expe mountains. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we, we really struggle to find anything that sold people to, um, you know, pause for a while, take in the view, listen to the birds. We've got a big thing in the Peak District where, you know, the, the natural world and outdoor activities are hugely important to the local economy, but a lot of that doesn't go back into actually caring for the environment in that landscape. And there's almost, because of harsh cuts to local services like national parks, for example, there's almost no information telling people about the vulnerability of some of these sites and species. So we can go on the moors in summer and at night... In some cases, you've got 20, 30 people who are going off piste across the moorland with bright lights on mountain bikes and they're sweeping across a whole area and that's causing disruption to birds of prey, to deer, to mountain hares. And it's just really having a bit of respect and realising that you're dealing with a vulnerable resource. So it's not that we don't want people to be there, it's just that we share the planet with a whole host of other species and they have just as much right as we do and we're not in the business of defeating them. Yeah, you know, we should be experiencing them and sharing with them. One of the conflicts I find myself at the moment wrestling with is that I love travel, I love wild places in the world and I've spent many years charging madly all over the world, relishing these wonderful places. But by doing so... I'm damaging the things that I love. Mm. And I'm kind of wrestling with what's the appropriate response to that. For example, should we not fly anywhere? Mm. Should we should we go mountain biking across the moors or should we leave mm. the, the grouse in peace? Where do you stand it's on a that? Fine, it's a fine balance. I mean, basically, you need to find ways to minimise the damage and maximise the, the positives. You know, I can't get to conferences if I don't fly. I realise that in flying that is a problem. Um, would my decision not to fly have any impact on the, the real scale of the problem? Uh, you know, in terms of things like climate, one of the big things that um, people don't want to really get to grips with is not just a matter of carbon. I think carbon is far too convenient. And this is me with slightly left-wing views. Um, you know, we come out with a solution to climate change, which is something that we can trade as a commodity. That, to me, seems far <laughs> too convenient. You can plant a few trees and you can, you know, allay all your problems. The, the basic problem, yes, there are greenhouse gases, yes, that's causing an issue, but the basic problem is the way that we're managing the landscape. We have too many people 
managing the world in a way which is clearly not sustainable. We're polluting the oceans. I mean, one of the, the dreadful things, if you see aerial photographs of the planet, look at the soil that is spewing out from every continent, every country into the sea. It's destroying the seas ecosystems and it's removing our capability in probably 50 to 100 years to grow food. It's, it's yeah. crazy. So should you not become a vegetarian? Well, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's a, a difficult decision because if you do become a vegetarian, then you step aside from a lot of the traditional ways that we manage the landscape, which bring huge ecological benefit. So the traditional hay meadows of the Yorkshire Dales, which are iconic and are worth millions of pounds in tourism revenue, for example, they disappear. The moorlands disappear. All these grazed landscapes disappear, and the food chains on which you know which depend on them disappear. So there are there are whole issues. I, I respect anyone who is vegetarian, and I cook a lot of vegetarian food, but I still like uh, the occasional steak or whatever. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I'm when I cycled into um, to Sheffield, I, uh, I've been cycling on the, the Sustrans bike paths quite a lot. Yeah. Um, which are great, and I was very surprised coming towards Sheffield that as I hit the River Don around Doncaster, mm -hmm. expecting a bit of a dump. Yeah, it was extremely beautiful. It was very green. Uh, someone told me to look out for kingfishers. Um, so, but and yet there are still these um, sort of industrial revolution bridges. I, I quite mm -hmm. like that mix of it. So, mm. can you tell me about some of the local nature successes around here? Yeah, I mean, the River Don, I think, is um, symbolic of all these things because when I was a kid, it was horrible. I mean, it was really depressing. It was smelly. It was polluted with sewage, detergent foam, non-biodegradable detergent foam blowing around the river and the streets covered in untreated sewage i mean this is pretty gross um and it was hot because the water we used to to cool the industry um we had no nothing really living there very few plants and almost no fish at all there, there's supposedly a few mutant sticklebacks with five eyes oh. you know, it's, it's, yeah that was it now the, the river don has what i call self rewilded and it's we've done a lot of work with the uh, the Five Years Walk Trust and other people now, the River Don Company and others, to renature the Don. But a lot of it is just nature doing its own thing. You know, we've stopped doing the bad things and nature's got back in. And we've got walkways and cycleways along the river and we've got wildflower meadows along the cycleways along the river and the river itself has regenerated. And you've now got kingfishers, otters, water voles, herons, goosanders, cormorants. The whole thing is vibrant. It's rich. It's green. And, yeah, it's it's really encouraging i, I yeah. really it's been one of my favorite parts of my ride around yorkshire so far and it's actually. accessible that's yeah. the other thing it's accessible to huge numbers of people yeah. and accessible i think is a really interesting part about rewilding so one of the big problems with urban society these days is is the mental health of the yeah. society yeah. and what impact can rewilding have on the mind well this is one of the themes of our event coming up next year rewilding 2020 because it's kind of trying to reach out um i've done quite a lot of work with bodies like the rspb and the wildlife trust and we we now know a lot more about the therapeutic value of nature which might be mental or physical health if you create if you facilitate the right contact with nature you can actually save the country through health service costs you can save millions if not billions of pounds we're not yet doing it properly and instead of for some things instead of giving people drugs then we just need to give them a um a recommendation to go and work for a few days a week with the rspb at old more nature reserve or to do some work on the river don with the community groups there you can actually improve people's mental well-being you can improve their physical well-being absolutely enormously we need to take that forward that has to be a part of the rewilding rewilding isn't just kind of rewilding the highlands of scotland uh, you know releasing wolves back into the landscape or something it's actually to do with a, a mental thing it's rewilding the mind it's rewilding our connection to nature rebuilding that vital thing which is an urban community we've lost one of the things that um, 
Sheffield, the outdoor city, um, has become very famous for in the last few years is um, wild, not that's completely wrong word, is um, m- chopping down all your trees, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things you've become famous uh, for, sadly. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to ask you about this because mm. I suspect that will launch you off into about yeah, a two-hour diatribe. Yeah, yeah. But linking to what we just talked about, um, tell me about the the chopping down of trees across the community and the the different areas of the city so you've got some poor mm-hmm. areas and some rich areas and how how that affects the well firstly which areas of trees get yeah, chopped down yeah, and secondly yeah. the mental effect on those mm-hmm. different areas mm-hmm. i mean one of the issues uh, right from the outset is there was no real long-term strategy um the approach to the street trees which in the urban area are hugely important and we'd back in the 1980s had identified green corridors and connections which were often the street trees connecting green spaces across the city as a sort of matrix um and there was no strategy about maintaining or enhancing that so what you then get is is protest from communities quite validly upset about what's happening but those communities which are able to protest are the ones which are often middle class educated white affluent um, communities they're vociferous that doesn't mean that their trees are any less valuable however what it does mean is that we need to pay due heed to those communities who are disadvantaged who are often far more urban and for whom the street trees the mature street trees are probably the only green things in their neighborhood and these communities often have a high predominance of um very urban major roads and at the moment particulates from diesel fumes and the like and these trees are all that stands between those people and that pollution so that needs to be something that is really taken into account before you set out on removing at one point threatening to remove 16,000 trees it's just crazy and in Sheffield we had this disparity between the affluent western suburbs and the poorer uh, eastern suburbs and if you go southwest to northeast there's a point where you have about a kilometer and the expected life expectancy of a male in the two areas differs by about 10 years over one kilometre. That's totally, totally unacceptable. Yeah, it's ghettoisation, isn't it? Yeah. So what impact, beyond the beyond the sort of diesel particulates and filtering, what impact can it have to have a whacking great tree <laughs> at the end of your street or even better, right outside your house? One thing for, trees for... do, they, they give you a sense of place. Okay, they tell you where they are or where you are. They also tell you when you are. They give you seasonality. So it's for a lot of people, it's their first contact with nature. It's what they wake up to. It's what they go to sleep next to. So it's hugely, hugely important. Trees are therapeutic. They are spiritually uplifting. They are something that's there. They alter your microenvironment, your microclimate, etc. But they are mentally hugely, hugely important. They tell a child that this is their neighbourhood. You grow up next to those trees. You grow with those trees. Um, You know, they're hugely important to you. And the fewer trees you've got in the area and the fewer green spaces you've got, the more important those remaining trees are. Yeah, absolutely. I was One phrase that I read um, somewhere of yours, you were writing about the new urban wild and and bringing wild to the people, which I really like because... I spend a lot of my time trying to encourage people to go out and get out into nature and the outdoors and towards adventure. Um, but there are, well, the vast majority of the population just think I'm bonkers. Well, yeah, first yeah. of all, more than that, the vast majority of the population have no idea that me and people like me exist. They don't care. And if they did, they just think he's a weirdo. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so, so essentially all I ever manage to do is preach to the converted. Mm, mm. So how do you go about building a new urban wild and bringing wild to the people? Mm. Well, I think the, the term rewilding has captured the public imagination. It's captured poli- politicians' imaginations. It's captured um, the media. So... There are aspects of rewilding that I think are problematic, but we'll not 
delve into that. As a term, it's fantastically powerful. And we tend to talk about wilder. We want a wilder future. So for us, rewilding is looking forward to a future. It's also looking forward to a future from the perspective of an urban society, an urban community, which has very often suffered what we call cultural severance. It's kind of breakdown in the contact and the dependence on nature. Even when we have nature... Uh, and we have contact, it's generally now what I would call a, a, we are a leisurely society and we go to leisurely landscapes where we look at nature, we don't work in nature. And the two experiences are different. doesn't mean that the leisurely view is bad in some way, it's just not the same as when you actually depend on nature for your next meal or for next year or for next year's harvest or next, then you actually have far more respect you have far more understanding and we've kind of broken that we've broken that connection um things like street trees help you rebuild seasonality you know to rebuild that contact so what we are looking for from re rewilding is it, is it becomes an all en embracing all encompassing philosophy if you like an idea that can link someone in a city centre who may have no more than a window box, an elderly person, someone with disability who can't get out to the high peaks or somewhere, they can still have contact with nature. The urban rivers are self-rewilded. You can have contact with nature there. And it should be from that right the way out to the hilltop, right way out to the mall, right way out to the mountaintop. That's rewilding writ broad. And we need to do that. We need to reconnect ordinary people not just the elite but ordinary people with nature so they feel part of it and can you can you recommend a book a, a non-complicated book that idiots like me and uh, both my listeners <laughs> will 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 um in will enjoy will and will be able to and it's sort of accessible book yeah, about the yeah, rewilding yeah. world the only two at the moment i think there is Feral by George Monbiot, which is a seminal volume and is, in his style, it's always really readable. Uh, I don't always agree with everything he writes, but that's it. He, he writes it very well, he speaks it very well. Um, I would love people to rush out and read my little book on Shadow Woods, which is a positive thing because it's a search for lost landscapes. And it was, it was written with local people that we trained to go and do the survey. So we trained people to read the landscape, to seek out these species, which I describe as time travellers through the centuries. So these species that have come down to us and are still there to be discovered. So I think that one, and then I'm hoping to do in the very near future a book on rewilding your garden, and that will hopefully speak to ordinary people yeah i really i was saying to you earlier i really think you should get on and write that i think there's a be a real appetite for rewilding your garden definitely. i hope so because yeah. we can all we can all do something we can all share this and we can all make a difference and if you i've always i mean i, I grew up in the 1960s 70s when we had horrible horrible ddt pollution and smogs and you know i'd go to school in a smog and you get there and you'd have yellow gunge on your chest you know it's as a little tiny and everyone wondered why you always got bronchitis and tonsillitis and stuff so it's, it's really negative but if you think now what and I, I always kind of felt well you could change the world even if you do it incrementally and even if we do it a bit at a time together if you kind of get a few other people to do it and they get other people and you can you can actually have a huge impact in, in a, your garden think how many gardens there are i think if each of us does our little bit what a difference we can make yeah i think i think really that's the only way to get on and change the world isn't it by yeah yeah doing what you can and you can look out of your window and you can see you know birds or hedgehogs or i, I remember a couple of years ago i was um talking to a researcher from the BBC and I was on the telephone looking out of my study into the garden and then suddenly the vegetation started moving. It's, whoa, there's something coming down the garden. It's this huge hedgehog. This was the hedgehog to end all hedgehogs. <laughs> and it's, it's so exciting. And I'm talking to this person who's a researcher on wildlife programmes and there in front of me, in my garden, I've got that contact. That is just fantastic and everyone can have that. Yeah, it's really important. I've actually been slightly encouraged in my cycle around Yorkshire by seeing lots of dead hedgehogs, which sounds a sad thing to say, but <laughs> it proves, hopefully, that there are live hedgehogs. If there are dead ones there, there must be enough live ones, well, yeah, yeah. Until the last dodo. Yeah, um, yeah. Because 
down south, I've not seen even a dead hedgehog in a decade. So I'm mm. quite mm. enjoying Yorkshire's dead hedgehogs. Mm. They're giving me hope. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the exciting things is to actually go out, and you'll be getting this as you're going in, on your travels, to go out into the urban landscape in the early hours of the morning rather than when everyone's busy, busy, busy. And the amazing thing I always find with that is that suddenly you've got families of foxes. I remember someone contacting me and said, we've got foxes on this main road uh, in Sheffield. And every morning at four o'clock, they're out there with their cubs playing on the main road. And then by six o'clock, they've gone again. And we're getting roe deer in the city centre, muntjac deer in the city centre. Um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And when people see these things, it is so amazing but often people never had that contact with nature before and that is wonderful and what you then hope is that sparks for some people the desire to do almost what you're doing to get out there into the wild and into the the bigger landscape yeah yeah i hope so um i was i was very glad that you agreed to chat with me and, and slightly surprised because you are so ridiculously busy um you've written books about sheffield the fens woodlands trees pubs peat cutting, eco-history, um, probably and more. Yeah, um, yeah. How do you get some balance in your life? So this is a change of topic. How yeah, do you get yeah. some balance in your life between work and family, blah, 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 yeah, all the other yeah, things? How do yeah. you get some balance in your life? Because I struggle with that. It is very difficult. When you're like you and I, you're passionate about something, it's there all the time and it's very hard to switch off. The difficulty I've got in a way is that my passion is often at other people's playgrounds. So I go for a walk in the country and I can't help identifying stuff. Or, and I, I, I don't know, it must be something about my face. People stop and ask me questions. So I end up giving an impromptu lecture to people on the canal or out in the bay district or something. And my wife will be saying, come on, come on, don't, you know, don't stop, don't I? And you can't help it because, uh, you know, you want to communicate, but you have to try and find those quiet spaces away from it all. And, I mean, for me, really, I suppose the, the main thing is my garden, which is my real ecotherapy, if you like. Um... And it's very, apart from that, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I'm interested in history, I'm interested in place, I'm interested in people. You can't get away from it. As you know from your travels, you cannot escape it, can you? I think it's a good thing to be a person who's interested in things, isn't it? But another good thing is what you've done, which is you have your passions in life and you've turned, managed to build your working life around your yeah, passions, yeah. which seems a sensible thing to do if possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can remember doing my PhD, which was on invasive rhododendron, and I'd done the history of this plant. Uh, and it, you end up not wanting to go anywhere near it again. When you finish the thing, you just want nothing to do with it. And you can't get You put on the TV and you've got a costume drama, and they're th walking through a clump of rhododendron. And you think, oh, no. And then the other thing is, because I do invasive species, and I, I know the dates at which p species are introduced, I'm watching something... And you've got Kira Knightley or someone on this, you know, this wonderful drama. And I say, that's not right. Yeah. You can't, that, that wasn't there at that date. No, I'm sure that's not 1800. That's <laughs> I'm sure your wife loves watching Downton <laughs> Abbey with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so even though you're busy and passionate and you've got a million letters after your name, you still sadly only have 24 hours in the day. Yeah, um, yeah. You can't do everything in life, but you can perhaps do anything. How do you choose what you are going to do and what you're just going what you will accept i can't do that it's very difficult um because i do quite a lot with local media i have lots of people contact me and they often assume that i can do things which i can't do in terms of solving problems and with the environment people often have limited interest until the problem occurs on their doorstep and then they're up in arms. And what I try to do is to give advice, but sometimes I have to step back from being drawn into it because I can't, I just can't do everything. Uh, so I do the best I can with the resources I've got. I try to guide people, I try to network, I try to pass them on to other people. And then occasionally something comes up which really captures what you want to do. So, for example, and I know I'm biased because I'm a Sheffielder, Died in the Wall, Blades fan for Sheffield United. Um, but we have a project at the moment which encapsulates everything that I'm 